Ladies and gentlemen, purveyors of fine audio content, welcome to The Fellowship. My name is Adam Hawk, although I am quickly becoming known as the grumpiest man alive. So true. Sitting across from me is Ryan Engel, and together we are Nation Golf. Let's knock out some business off the top and then get into the show. Agenda item number one is that we are currently running a 30% off sale. Still? Still. Till when? Well, we'll get there. I appreciate how enthusiastic you are at 6.30 in the morning to get into the program. I thought it was just on the weekend. When's the end date? Listen, first off, every communication that went out about the sale on Friday had the end date in it, and you've been podcasting me long enough to know that, of course, I'm about to mention the end date. Okay. So not only did you not read what had previously come out, you're not waiting patiently Till I get to the end date. And you're surprised by what? None of this. Okay, good. Keep going. Everything site-wide, 30% off at nationgolf.com. Everything we offer can be yours for 30% off the sticker price. And all you have to do is use your fat little sausage fingers and type in the code NATION30 at checkout. And the computer machine will handle the rest. That's code NATION30, N-A-T-I-O-N-3-0 at checkout. The sale ends Tuesday, June 11th at midnight. So hurry on over to nationgolf.com and see if there's anything left. Tuesday. We've got a ton of new stuff coming, and we need to make some room for it. So take advantage while you can. Agenda item number two. The podcast that you are listening to right now is now offered across three different YouTube platforms. YouTube Main, which is the YouTube everyone knows and loves. YouTube Living Room. What is that? YouTube Living Room is for all you fancy folk who have the YouTube app on your Apple TV. And it's different? Or Roku or gaming console. It's different? It's a little different. The interface is a little different. Have you ever used YouTube on your living room television? Uh, I understand that. I'm asking it's different in the fact that like you're some Joe Schmo and you post something. You have to tell your audience that it's on these two separate things. Isn't it just the same thing? Like if you searched on either one of those things, it just pops up, right? It sure does, but the interface is a little different. Then what are we talking about? I'm just letting people know that if they want to listen to the podcast off of their television at home while they're doing some chores, while they're vacuuming, while they're dusting, while they're spraying the coffee table with Pledge, that they can do that. Seems like a little over detailed, if you ask me. And we are also available on YouTube Music, which... YouTube Music? What is that? Here we go. My goodness. YouTube Music is YouTube's new Spotify ripoff app for your cellular telephone device. Oh, here they come. Now, I know what you're thinking. If this podcast is on YouTube, surely it means that the good guys at Nation are filming their show now. No. No. It does not mean that. Cameras are expensive, guys. It should mean that. Cameras are real expensive these days. But it doesn't. Not yet. It just means that the audio is now available across YouTube's three platforms. Yes, we have plans to make this a vodcast in the future, but we're not there yet. Do you want to ask me what a vodcast is, or can you figure that out? I can figure that out. Okay, very good. However, because we have YouTube monetized- Little dad vod. couple of dad vods over here (laughs) because we have youtube monetized it means that if you listen to the show on youtube we get paid and based on our a lot of money based on our current listenership and how many people use youtube to listen to podcasts if you make the switch and start consuming this content over there we are potentially looking at tens of thousands of cents (laughs) yeah yeah I thought you were going to say tens of dollars. I've already used that joke. Yeah. In all seriousness, folks, go to the Nation Golf YouTube channel, give all of our podcasts a big old thumbs up, and just play the old episodes through on mute. We do it here at the office. uh, Yeah, every little bit helps. Yeah. We turn on our show. We let it play all day. We have it on mute. If YouTube can buy our U-Band, it's a win-win. Yes. It's a win-win for the listener. It's a win-win for our taste buds. It's a win-win for the unbelievable aromatic smells of the office. For those that don't know, U-Ban, which was not a play on words with YouTube, is the coffee of choice around Nation Golf HQ, and we are recording very early this morning, and so we have a nice <sighs> piping hot pot of U-Ban going. I mean, does it get any better? 
So if you go and listen to this show on YouTube, perhaps the fractions of cents that will add up over time will pay for our U-Ban. What if we got sponsored by U-Ban? That would be cool. Anyway, go over to YouTube, listen to the show there. Why don't you take a sip of coffee? Because your whole mantra, your energy level, it's just lacking for me right now a little bit. Great sip. I will tell you, you're the master of the ratio, the water I got the ratio. It's just muddy enough. Yep. It's just a touch of cowboy. You know, not a lot. It's not something that you smell and go running to the bathroom. It's like you need a couple sips before you have a full-on river runs through it. (laughs) On today's iPod broadcast, Scotty Scheffler wins again. Malbon Golf successfully herds the sheep again. And we're talking Disneyland again. In the words of Evan Lovett from LA in a Minute, Let's get into it. Let's get into it. It wasn't pretty, but it didn't have to be. And for the fifth time this calendar year, Scott Alexander Scheffler is a winner on the PGA Tour. The memorial at Jack's Place belongs to the world's number one golfer. And for the first time in a long time, we saw a real golf tournament. Just a bloodbath at Muirfield Village with a cut line at plus four and a champion who shot three over in the final round on a day that only saw six players get into red figures. That's the kind of golf we like to see. I was going to say this. This was in my notes. What notes? My notes are right up here, dude. Arnie and Jack, only two tour stops of the year that actually have real golf. Both places played tough, and they figured out the formula. It's quite simple, folks. We've been saying it for freaking years now. Make the rough thick and sticky, put a premium on ball striking, and make the greens fast and firm so you can't just fly it to the hole. And it separates the men from the boys. To me, it's real golf. If you're a real golfer, you really understand the game and know what you're watching rather than just being like, oh, wow, look, he spun it back and... Look how close he is to the hole. Look how many birdies he has. If you're a home run derby guy, I guess the John Deere Classic looks really cool to you. To me, watching these guys have to really pinpoint where to land it and just getting taxed, running through the green and showing their skills to keep the wheels from falling off. It's great golf. It's so exciting. Scotty Scheffler proves again that when you put a tough golf course out there in front of him, he just proves he's the best. Even when he doesn't have his best game or the ball's not going in, I mean, he burned like seven edges in that final round. It could have been a landslide, but that's golf. I get it. They don't all go in. But T to green, he still played better than anyone. He won with a really clutch putt, which was pretty radical. He just, again, is proving that he's just in a different stratosphere than these guys. It's kind of scary. I, I think as this year goes on and if he wins next week, man, this whole police story at the PGA Championship is going to be bigger than it was then. Such a good point, because if he does bag a U.S. Open at Pinehurst, which is an incredibly difficult golf course, and you just mentioned that Scotty seems to rise to the occasion at difficult golf courses, if he wins there and he's got two-fourths of the Grand Slam, and we all know that he cannot get it because the PGA Championship is in the rear view, and the police potentially took that away, and we're not all rolling into the British Open with a chance to see something that not even... Tiger Woods had done. Tiger got the Tiger Slam. He never got the calendar. No. Legit, straight up Grand Slam. I think you're right. That's a great point. That will come back and become more of a storyline if he does go and rip this U.S. Open. Look, it's borderline impossible to put Scotty's season into proper context. And frankly, I really don't feel like it. If you follow golf, you know that you're witnessing the kind of history that will be talked about for the rest of time. It's June 10th. And Scotty Scheffler has already set the record for highest season earnings ever at $24 million. His caddy, Ted Scott, has made more money than all but 40 PGA Tour guys this season. Let this really sink in for a second. Whatever you're doing, stop and absorb these words. There are 190 dudes who swing the bats for a living who have been out-earned by a guy that carries them instead. And that list of 190 who are looking up at Ted Scott's bank account include Jordan Spieth, Tony Finau, Matt Fitzpatrick, Victor Hovland, Tom Kim, Minwoo Lee, Adam Scott, Keith Mitchell, Justin Rose, and Ricky Fowler. And you know what, Hawk? 
couldn't be happening to a better dude. Besides the money, Scotty just became the first player since Tom Watson in 1980 to win five tournaments before the U.S. Open. Remember, Eldrick Taunt Woods didn't turn pro until the early 90s, so Scotty just did something that the big cat never did. He's got two Masters, two Players' Championships, and double-digit tour wins. If he retired today at the age of 27, he would be in the World Golf Hall of Fame, and half of his accolades would have come in the last five months. That's how utterly in fuego senor scheffler is at the moment throw in his wrongful arrest and his new baby boy being born a month ago and the fact that he's been in the top 10 of each of his last 11 tournaments and you've got nothing short of one of the most insane seasons ever and it's only halfway through it's only just begun (laughs) let's rewind a second hawk all right we back up a few episodes you heard it here first you love to hear it I just told everybody across these very airwaves that we're spitting our U-band through today, we are at the beginning of witnessing an absolute historical run. And the question was, is this childbirth going to change what seems to be an unflappable guy? And I think that question's been answered. He is just so locked in and so comfortable in his game and his own skin and his swing and his place in competition, I don't see him wavering much from the trajectory that he is currently on. What I saw yesterday in that final round where Colin Morikawa was paired with Scotty Scheffler, and Scotty Scheffler would go on to shoot three over par and get, quote-unquote, outplayed by Colin Morikawa. If you're looking at the scorecard only, Colin Morikawa had a better Sunday than Scotty Scheffler. It ultimately ended up not mattering because Scotty beat him by one stroke. But what I saw yesterday was Tiger esque in the sense that I believe that Scotty is now occupying rarefied air where the guys playing alongside him have an extreme intimidation factor. Yeah. They're no longer just playing the golf course, they're playing Scotty. And Scotty's not playing the other guy. He's playing the golf course. And that was true for Tiger Woods as well. And what's happening is these guys like Colin Morikawa or anyone else paired with Scotty in the final group knows I don't just have to beat the golf course. I have to beat this guy. And this guy, frankly, is unbeatable at this point. And when you put that in another golfer's head, they have to start pressing for perfection, whereas the other guy just has to hold the boat steady. And so Scotty's got this massive advantage that we haven't seen since Tiger Woods, which is he's intimidating the other guys. You have to play not only perfect golf, but you also have to hope for something that likely isn't going to happen. And that's Scotty Scheffler. And in the case of Tiger Woods, Tiger back in the day, taking a step back. So you have to be the best you've ever been, and you have to catch the guy on an off day. Yeah, it's incredible. I will give Colin some credit. He played with a lot more grit in a final pairing, final round. I know he shot a lower score on Sunday. I still don't think he played tee to green better than Scotty. I mean, Scheffler burned six or seven edges on Sunday. It could have been a landslide victory. He hit some great putts. They just didn't go in. We say this over and over again. I still don't think that was his A game. I don't think that was his B game yesterday. (sighs) How do you not pick him for Pinehurst? You ready to get mad at me and to have a disagreement? On the heels of everything we just mentioned, the historic season, the intimidation factor, the fact that this guy just doesn't miss and seems unflappable, and that we are giving him tournaments before he even plays them, on the heels of all of that, why am I so bored by this guy? I think it comes down to the fact that I am bored by Scotty Scheffler, the person, and I think I personally need a little bit more from him in terms of showmanship interviews, crowd interaction, social media, mic'd up moments to be really entertained by this guy. Even this dude's arrest was boring. You pull anyone else out of their car and slam them against the door and throw them in handcuffs, you're going to get something more than what we got with Scotty, which was him turning around to Jeff Darlington and asking sheepishly, can you help me? And then telling the world three weeks later that everything is fine and it was a big misunderstanding. Look, I'm self-aware enough to know that what I'm asking for has a degree of some professional wrestling in it, wanting the wow factor and the bravado. But aren't I entitled to know 
what I like. And am I not entitled to want that? I'm the one investing my time into this on the weekend. I'm the one writing takes about it and doing podcasts. I'm the one following it. Of course, he doesn't have to give it to me. That's fine. That's his prerogative. But I also don't have to love him. And that's where we are. Scotty is Scotty and I'm me. I'm not as entertained as I want to be by a guy having one of the most historic seasons we've ever seen. But I truly don't believe that I'm the only one who is a bit bored by Scotty Scheffler. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The late Jerry Buss knew that greatness alone wasn't enough. You had to put on a show to be entertaining. And Scotty just isn't that entertaining to me. Hey, you do have the right. You do have the right to be a sheep. That's what this is. Scotty Scheffler is three fist pumps away that final round from playing Tiger's exact game, but he's just not marketed in the way that Tiger was to the Nike sneakerhead ESPN culture of the modern sports fan. So that's why he's boring. If you can't see that he plays just as an exciting game as Eldrick did, you're not a real golfer. You're a hacker. If you can't see that that's exciting, knowing that he's stepping up and hitting these incredible shots under pressure, if that doesn't excite you, you're not here for the golf. You're here for the pro wrestling. You're here for the theatrics. You're here for the Nike commercials. You're here for the Malbon fits. You're not here for golf. And it's not your fault. You grew up in that era, and you were fed that shit over and over again. And Tiger let you down over and over again, and you still keep coming back for him. When we're watching him try to make the cut in these tournaments now, you're in the back room going, yes, when he hits it to six feet. Fucking Scotty Scheffler is stuffing it, dude. On the toughest tracks with the most pressure against the best players in the world, and you're bored with it. Scotty Scheffler is doing a number of things, and I just love it. He is exposing who the true golf fans are. He is exposing how far off the tracks golf is. And he is exposing how pop culture has infiltrated this game and given it an unrealistic spike that it can't sustain. I want him to win more. I want him to be more boring. And I want all of these line skippers to go away because this guy could save the game. He could make all of this fluff and all of this whipped cream on shit finally go away and quite frankly folks you love to see it side note on scotty scheffler and trust me i know how annoying backseat parenting can be but i have to say it your brand new 30 day old baby boy does not need to be greenside at the golf tournament it's sunny it's hot it's loud he's a month old and i was you know what just skip this one i'm not going to skip it skip it i'm not going to skip it I was freaking out a bit watching you hold that brand new baby like a brand new dad, not knowing at all how to properly administer head support and walking around a bunch of screaming fans and media who want to grab you for an interview. Michael Jackson holding his son blanket out over the balcony thinks you're being a little irresponsible here. You're in golf spikes on uneven terrain, backpedaling and turning around to shake Jack's hand and do an interview with Amanda and get handed a trophy, and you're holding a 30-day-old baby, there's such a difference between a three-month-old baby and a 30-day-old baby. That baby belongs in a swaddle, in a bassinet, in a house, in a climate-controlled environment, out of the sun, listening to a noise machine, not at a chaotic golf tournament that you just won. How crazy that Adam Hawk has a stay-at-home woman take. This is a guy's trip. I'm playing golf. <laughs> You're an idiot, dude. I mean, I I am... St- hey, I love my kids, but it's really fun to be away from them. <laughs> Stay at home, woman? Yeah, that's all I heard. That whole take. That's all I heard from you. I said stay at home, baby. Uh, you, you masked it and... Yep, yeah, because who's going to take care of him? him while he's playing golf or her? This, we all know what you meant, Hawk. That's why I said you should skip it. I, I told you to skip it. I don't need to dignify your incredibly... <laughs> idiotic reaction Uh, with a response but i just want to make it clear that i did not say stay at home woman i didn't say it but i think you meant it (laughs) all right here we go again 
talking about Malbon Golf because here we are again with Jason Day stealing all the headlines with another zany outfit. If you're keeping score at home, first it was the yacht sail pants, then it was the billboard sweater vest, and now it's the ultra casual untucked poly polo leisure wear short shorts and white tube socks combination that he wore during a practice round ahead of the memorial this past week at Muirfield Village, a.k.a. Jack's Place. I'll be the first to admit that I paid a whole hell of a lot less attention to this latest stunt than I did when he pulled his act at the Masters for a number of reasons. Muirfield Village, despite being Jack's Place, isn't Augusta National, and the memorial isn't the Masters, and playing a practice round isn't playing a major with Tiger Woods in a featured group that had every single shot for 36 holes broadcast on national television. But I did see the pictures, and I did see the reaction, and all of it is extremely predictable and played out. Malbon Golf is simultaneously herding sheep and fishing with dynamite, and they know it. The question is, do you know it? Do you know that they aren't dressing Jason Day like hipster good, good dorks because it's what their designers deemed to be the highest version of functional golf fashion? Did you know that they're dressing Jason Day like this to get the exact reaction that both sides are giving them? And did you know that this is extremely calculated marketing and that all the extremely polarized conversation around it is a business's dream? And they are going to keep running this formula as long as we all keep taking a side. It's equal parts echo chamber, equal parts detractors. On one hand, you have sheep and fanboys that will quite literally cape up and defend anything and everything this brand does because this brand has tapped into a validating feeling for a certain group of people who feel like they have everything right and the world is against them. These people are loyal to a fault because they lack any sort of nuance and they are incapable of discerning thought. It's all or nothing. It's a religion. And in most religions, you aren't picking the parts you like and discarding those that you don't. You are blindly following everything. You're all in and ready to die for it. You're not thinking because someone else, someone far more powerful than you, is doing the thinking for you. On the other hand, you have the detractors and haters who can't wait to clown on all of it and point to the fallacies and the shortcomings and argue the merit of its place and culture. And these people end up doing just as much, if not more, promoting of the other side because they can't stop talking about it. The more you talk about it and how much you don't like it, the bigger and more powerful and culturally relevant it gets. And that is good for business. Malbon Golf is a business. Their business quite literally depends on people knowing about it and talking about it. So, of course, they're going to lean in and do things that get people talking. For sure. And at this point, I have no choice but to call Malbon Golf marketing geniuses. I cannot remember a golf brand having this many people so hot and bothered so quickly. Yeah. And this goes for both sides. The fanboys are the most nauseating people on the internet. Steve Malbon could take a shit on your face and you would lap it up and ask for seconds. And that's after you paid a premium for it and right before you go on Instagram to yell at anyone who dare say, hey, you know, you have shit on your face, right? <laughs> but the other side is just as bad and totally unequipped to take on the streetwear mafia because let's be real. Most of the people who hate Malbon are the worst dressed guys on the planet. If you're wearing a block letter hat, robe back Q-zip, a floral print bad birdie shirt, Lululemon shorts, ankle socks, and all birds slip on golf shoes, just sit this one out. I know you think you're fighting for tradition, but you aren't tradition. You're 50 years late of tradition and 10 years behind everyone else. You are in proverbial no man's land. So the fight is between two extreme groups, neither of which I want any part of. But Malbon found a way to galvanize each and every one of them. You're either yelling about them or yelling at them. And my gosh, that is good for business, is it not? I said it before and I'll say it again. It's not fashion. It's not a clothing brand. It's this hype beast marketing that the likes of Supreme pioneered and this sneaker culture thing. What's genius about their marketing is that they know their target audience and they're playing them to a T. And I don't agree with what they're doing, but I can't knock the hustle. Right. They're in it for this success and the hype and growing. And it's not just this power couple that owns this brand. This is a group of people trying to turn this business into big business. That's 
what this is. That's fine. Nothing against that. Good for them. And as much as I oppose a lot of the, the looks and style of it all, like I hope they succeed. I think golf is massive. There's a lane for everyone. And I do think that everyone has a thing. Now, that being said, there's still some rules and history and tradition to this thing. Time and place. Are we going to just like skip by the details of it all while everyone, like you says, capes up for this for no reason? When have you ever worn baggy nylon pants with web mesh pockets that have an elastic waist with belt loopholes and a white belt? Any other brand put that out, you'd be like, oh my God, that's embarrassing. But you put a cursive M on it and it's just, get the crackers out, it's time for a circle jerk. It's so obvious, it's disgusting. I like Steven. We even exchanged some messages over the weekend because we were both laughing about and how fucking cringe that was. And him and I were roasting those guys. We have a fun relationship, but he knows that I'm not afraid to speak my mind and my opinions. He respects that, and I respect him. I'll give them their flowers. I think I said this the last time. Their women's line is probably the best women's line in golf. It's so elevated and classic and classy. It's incredible. Their men's line is like you said. Chad Muska just put his boombox down and started playing golf. They are orchestrating a reaction and getting their sheep to go to bat for him. Plain and simple. The details matter. So you got Steven on this podcast that everyone's sharing and going crazy, and he's complaining about the golf haters. These dudes, this golf, angry golf guys, they just, they don't stop, bro. They wore these shorts two days in a row, and they're talking about, oh, great, he's wearing swimming trunks. Jay Day just said, fuck it, he's out here wearing swimming trunks now on the golf course, which they're not swimming trunks, right? And then I see this meme, he got him in a wetsuit. They said, next, he's going to pull up to a, pull up to <laughs> Pinehurst with a wetsuit. He's going to be golfing in a wetsuit. Oh, I can't with these guys. Dude, this is what you want. This is why you did this. Yeah, those looked like fucking swim trunks. And by the way, guys, all you sheep out there in the comments saying, I don't care what anyone says, this fits fire. None of you guys have a pair of shorts like that in your drawer. None of you. None of you have print textile walk shorts. None of you. I guarantee it. And yes, they look like swim trunks. In fact, they looked more like underwear. What you do have, I guarantee, is print boxer shorts in your drawer that look just like that. So for you to be like, oh, you golf haters for calling out a guy wearing short shorts with a super basic Walmart looking black, plain, untucked polo with short shorts and white tube socks. Oh, you're hating on that. Uh, no, my eyes just work because he looks like an idiot. For everyone to be like, best looking guy on tour, Jason Day looks so uncomfortable to me. I will give him this. It takes some balls to step outside your comfort zone and put that shit on and show up and try to play, and he's doing it. He's trying, and I give him credit for that. And I think we almost saw his balls with those shorts. That's what I'm saying. That being said, by no means are you looking at a super confident guy. And he said it after the whole master's sweater vest thing, that he is just being told what to wear, and he's wearing it. He ain't picking this shit out, you guys. He's not the drip master. You're going to bat for this marketing machine. It's all about the clicks. It's all about the engagement. It's all about the traffic. It's all about the hype. If you're going to continue to get caught up in that and not know what you're partaking in, you're buying tickets to the show, and you don't even know it's fake. Now, we both agree that this is very good for business, Malbon business, but is it good for golf? That's an argument I see all the time made by the Malbon sheeple and the dripsters. Yeah, explain that. Right. They, they say that all the time. But I mean, look, Augusta, Jack's place, I'm fine with his outfit at San Clemente Muni, but when you bring that to the memorial, you're only doing it to get us to talk about it. Exactly. And so they scream, this is good for golf. Jason Day turning Augusta National into a commercial is good for golf. Jason Day going untucked with short shorts and tube socks is good for golf. Don't lie. 
it's good for you. It validates you. This isn't about golf. This is about you and what you think is right. How is a super casual look at a professional golf event at a prestigious country club good for golf? Because it lowers the barrier, lowers the standard. Who does that benefit, golf or you and your personal beliefs? All I'm asking is that you be honest. This isn't good for golf. It's good for you. It's confirmation bias. It's validation. It lowers the standard to where you feel the standard should be. Now, I'm of the belief that golf is worth tucking your shirt in for because I'm of the belief that it's a privilege and that the grounds crew who woke up at 3 in the morning to get to the course by 4 to be on the mower by 4.30 to perfectly manicure acres and acres of an outdoor playground for my friends and me, those people are worth the extra effort. If I opened up a restaurant, a fine dining restaurant, and I invited my friends and family to a soft opening, and they showed up in shorts and flip-flops with their hats on inside, my very first feeling would be that they did not deem my place, my food, my hard work as worthy of their respect, and they showed that to me by the way that they dressed. You dressing yourself is absolutely a form of self-expression. So wouldn't you want to express yourself as being respectful of where you are? Jason Day was at Jack Nicholas's place, and he dressed like he was at 3 Jack National. Shout out to Club Pro Guy. That was a skate park outfit at an elevated, historic PGA Tour event hosted by the greatest player of all time. The same player who sits greenside on Sunday in a suit jacket, dress shirt, trousers and dress shoes and shakes the hand of everyone who walks off the 72nd hole should jack be in shorts giving fist bumps and titty twisters instead because that would be good for golf (laughs) when you put it like that you realize how silly this all really is you are allowed to love malbon and everything that they do and love jason day and his outfit and want to dress like him and i support all of that i do But I'm allowed to think that it lowered the standard and wasn't appropriate for the golf course, the host, or the event because it wasn't. So far, Jason Day and Malbon have disrespected Augusta National and Jack Nicklaus in a matter of months. I honestly think, Ryan, that you and I should get to La Trobe and stand guard at Arnold Palmer's estate before they go knocking on those doors trying to take a piss on the umbrella logo or write Arnold Palmer's signature in graffiti because cursive is just too formal, bro. If defending a standard makes us the bad guys, we will be the bad guys. No problem. We'll do it happily. We'll make a lot less money and be a lot less famous. But at least we'll never have to go to sleep knowing that Augusta National told one of our players to take off one of our pieces and that we never sent someone to Jack's place in tube socks and Daisy Dukes. We are living in an era where narcissism is not only celebrated, it's encouraged. If you can't see that that's where we're at with everything, that we're in jammies at the airport culture then it's going to be hard for you to see through what they're marketing. And they know this. They're smart. They got a lot of smart people in a room planning all this shit out. Like it all you want. I'm not criticizing you for liking it. I'm not criticizing it for existing. But let's try to graduate from the kids' table and see what the adults are talking about. Because there's more to all of this than you realize time and place. I mean, I dress casual 99% of the time. I'm in dickies and a t-shirt almost every day because I'm just coming to the office, getting stuff done. But if I'm getting that phone call, hey, we got a time. You want to join me? I'm suiting up because that's what my grandfather did. That's what the guys who respected the game did. That's what I feel like is important because it's such a privilege to play golf. I look at it as a nice restaurant. I don't give as much shit as I get for dressing up for Muni. Everyone's so quick to be like, look at all these golf haters. You guys started this whole discussion. You're the one that started showing up like that and being like, oh, look, you're wearing pants. I can't tuck my shirt in. Like, I hate that. Oh, cotton. I need this dry fit. You guys are the ones that are trying to change this thing. You started this argument. The whole point the finger at the gatekeepers thing is so low fucking rent. You're so contradictory. You're trying to change the narrative of what's really happening here. And what's really happening here is you came in with the tube socks and the fucking shorts and the shirt untucked, pointing the finger at everyone else and saying that, 
golf needs change. You came here with that. That's fine. But time and place, man. You think all those people who worked their whole lives and found success and fell in love with Muirfield Village and bought a house on the course and follows the rules of that country club and the history that Jack put into that place and wearing jackets to dinner and stuff, you think they're thrilled to watch a PGA professional look like he's trying to go skate in the Mountain Dew League? (laughs) And you're going to say, we're the haters for calling it out? You know what you're doing, dude. My dad used to always say this when my brother and I were growing up. My brother and I are 15 months apart. Irish twins, if you will. We used to fight a lot. And as the older brother, I was frequently the antagonizer. And you know what it's like because you're an older brother yourself. You can push the buttons of a younger brother to the point where he blows up and then you step back and go, whoa, how'd that happen? You're the one in trouble now. And my dad used to always say, you cannot pull the pin on a grenade and be surprised when it goes off. Yeah. You cannot send Jason Day to Jack's place dressed like he's going to a pool party and then be surprised when there's a reaction That's to That's my it. thing. I don't care that they did it. I know why they're doing it. I'm well aware of what this marketing machine is, what their angle is, where they want to go with it, what their goal is, what they're trying to do. To me, all this shit is obvious. Now, clearly, like we just spoke of, It's not obvious to all (laughs) y'all. You're just going to bat and picking sides. And that's fine. If that's what you're going to do, right on, brother. I believe in a free country. I believe in free market economy. I believe in free will, freedom of speech. You do it. But with that comes my freedom to have my opinions on it too. If you think for one minute that all that can happen and then you can go on and bellyache about the haters, that's where I'm like, Hold on, Chief. I love you, Steve, but you can't blow hard about all this stuff when you orchestrated all of it. And that's my problem with it. Dude, sit back, put your shades down, hit that big dog chair on recline and enjoy the fruits of your labor, bro. Don't start getting all Ben Baller on it and fucking complaining to all the minions. Usually he's really calculated in how he interacts with the whole mantra of what's going on. And I thought that was a little out of character for him to like, A, acknowledge the golf haters, quote unquote, and then kind of bellyache about it. And it's like, ooh, that's the first little chink in the armor I've seen. Usually he's always projecting the good stuff and he kind of fell into the trap there. I I wonder if it's getting to him. I think the double-edged sword here and I am purely guessing. I don't know anything. I know you talk to Steve. I don't. I like Steve. He seems like a nice, cool guy. But I think having your name on it is the double-edged sword. Oh, yeah. You get all the credit when things are great, and you're talking to your echo chamber, and people are pumping you up saying you are quite literally saving golf. Keep going, bro. You're doing it. And then you have everyone else who doesn't like it, but the commonality in it all is is that they are saying Malbon, Malbon, Malbon. This is this guy's last name. It's his wife's last name now. It's his kid's last name. And if you name a company after yourself, you have to be prepared to take the praise that makes you feel really good and then read all the comments with your last name in it saying Malbon sucks, Malbon sucks. And here's the thing is when people say Malbon sucks, they're talking about Malbon golf. That's a tough pill to swallow. But you're reading it as I suck, I suck. That will wear on the best of guys. Do you want to talk about my day at Disneyland or do you want to rap? I want to talk about it. Do you? Okay. Make it quick. Disneyland, the happiest place on earth. If your idea of happiness is getting turned upside down for every penny in your pocket and waiting in lines all day. Just kidding. I'm not going to do the grumpy bit. I went over the weekend, had a great time, early celebration of my daughter's birthday because I looked at the forecast. I saw a high of 71 this past Saturday and I pulled the reservation confirmation trigger. If you're going to be outside standing on pavement all day with two kids under the age of eight, might as well do it in June gloom instead of July fry. So we did. Great decision. Game changing, really. And so was the 15 pack of nicotine pouches by Zinn that I picked up on my way into the park. But none of that was as game changing as purchasing the Genie Plus Pass, which allows you to skip the lines with the push of a button on the Disneyland app, Nothing like paying for privilege. So worth it. Best money ever spent. Great tip from you and your wife to get this thing. You have to. No kid has the attention span to wait in lines anymore. YouTube and iPads has ruined any chance we have of parents to avoid boredom meltdowns, which usually come five minutes into anything 
that doesn't provide sensory overload. And standing in line is the polar opposite of sensory overload. So we walked into the park at 8 in the morning and ended up leaving at 10 o'clock at night. 14 hours spent Damn. between Disneyland and California Adventure. You park hopped? We had the park hopper, yeah. And I would love to give a shout out to the person who hooked this up, but I sent them a text yesterday and said, can I mention you on the podcast? Haven't heard back. And I don't want to dox this person because potentially people know him and say, can I get free tickets? And I don't want to put him in that spot, nor do I want to put him in a bad spot with his employer. So I will just say this. You know who you are, and thank you so much. 14 hours spent between Disneyland and California Adventure. Can't believe my kids made it, but it wasn't all sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows. The wheels came off around 5 p.m. in the most epic of ways. Continue. It all started when we crossed over from Disneyland to California Adventure. The Genie Pass told me to come on over to Grand Rapid Falls for immediate entry. And I thought, here we go. This will give everyone their second wind. Let's go right into another ride, get the momentum going again. For those that don't know, Grand Rapid Falls is an insane water rafting ride where they post a million signs that say, quote, you will get wet, you may get soaked. I've done it before. I know what can happen, but I thought to myself, the kids will love this. It's fun. Kind of crazy. A little water never killed anyone. Plus, sometimes you come out totally dry. So let's roll the dice and get the party restarted. We get on the raft. It's like a giant tire. You sit in with eight seats. So it's us four and another family. Mind you, someone had just come off that ride. They were wearing a waterproof poncho. They looked at me, handed it to me, and gave me the silent look almost to say, put this on your kids so you don't ruin the entire day. I grabbed it, offered it to my kids, who both said, no thanks. No. We get going. Immediately, we're spinning 360s, and the kids are visibly freaked out, making the faces of people who have just seen a ghost. You know that little kid face, right? They're just oh, yeah. in complete shock and terror. It's fast, it's wild, and then the first drop, a big one. A tidal wave comes over our raft and just dumps on my eight-year-old daughter. And I mean, it was like the ice bucket challenge from a few years ago. You remember that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she soaked. Then the screaming, the crying, the hysterical meltdown. Meanwhile, the other family is laughing their collective asses off because they have a front row seat to a viral video. They're loving it. Yeah. Bastards. There's still three minutes left of this ride. Drop after drop, my daughter is drawing the short end of the stick, just getting pummeled by wave after wave. <laughs> Dirty river water. She's looking at me, screaming, crying, yelling, and it's the look of, I trusted you, Dad. You did this. You did this to me. Finally, the ride ends. It's a mad dash to get off and get out. She's a wreck. We're looking for a store, not just a store, but a store that sells underwear, socks, pants, shirts, and a sweatshirt. Yep. We finally find one. $210 later, my daughter has a new outfit. <whistles> I get her a hot chocolate, chocolate croissant, anything to warm her up and make her feel happy again. It kind of, sort of works. We watch a parade, ride another ride. Things start turning back. Then we go to Cars Land. We stand in that line for an hour. They see the cars come whipping by. They hear the screams. They turn to us and say, we're out. We don't want to do this. This is too scary. So we completely gas an hour oh, of being in line. Oh, no. They would have liked that, too. It's not that bad. I know. It's the best ride there. Couldn't convince them. We're on hour 12 of being in the park. Everything's starting to really go downhill. So, yeah, they said no freaking way, and we're walking out of line. Then we get out. My daughter tells me she's going to throw up. Throw up? So we get her some pretzels and water. She can't even get a pretzel down. She can't drink. She says she's going to yak. I'm thinking to myself, I screwed this up. Grand Rapid Falls, the fear I put inside her, the dirty water she swallowed, the trauma, the hot chocolate and chocolate croissant that she's crashing from. I can feel this little girl's pain, the knots in her stomach, the vomit in her chest wanting to come up. It was right here and then that I felt like the worst dad in the world. One more trip to the gift shop on the way out, a toy to make it all better. The fireworks going off over our heads as we <laughs> walk to the tram to get the hell out of there. Disneyland one, Adam Hawk zero, the mouse always wins. Yeah, you know, you can't try to get all your yayas in in one go and not have a diabolical ending. You set yourself up for disaster and you didn't even know it, but that's okay. It's one of those things where you have to have a strategy. We went with some seasoned vets last summer and they had the system. So we went with them. They do this thing where it's like, all right, three o'clock, back to the hotel. We sit at the hotel pool, had a couple coldies and just relax. A couple guys took naps. 
and you go back in at five and you do this little battery recharge and you get that second wave and go back in. And I was like, wow, what an absolutely veteran maneuver to do what you did. Whew. It's hard to get a happy ending with that strategy. You blew it. Your kids looked at you like that because that was the truth. You did that to them. <laughs> so I know you meant well, but once again, the hawkster, grumpiest man on earth, made your kids not even like Disneyland. No, they loved it. They had a great time. They did, and we had a great time too, but it comes down to this. We bit off way more than we could chew. Yeah. That's the one thing that I'll say about like buying the three-pack or if you're rich mm-hmm. enough, you can get the season pass because when you go to that park and you don't carry the pressure of trying to get a lot of shit in, you enjoy it so much more. When you do what you did, it's hard to get a happy ending going about it that way. You're totally right. And it was this pressure of we have to literally do everything. Yeah. And not just at one park, at two parks. It was a marathon. Yeah. And they say the marathon is two races, the first 20 miles and the last six. Yeah. And I've gone through two of them. I know what that's like. You feel real good. And then you get to mile 20 and the wheels come off. And those last six miles are impossible. And we definitely ran a marathon on Saturday, and it was a marathon that was two different races. And as soon as we crossed over into California Adventure, which we were so excited about, we watched cars the night before just to really burn into their memory what Radiator Springs looks like. Yeah. And I blew it. That car's ride is pretty rad, too. Yeah. The one you didn't go on. I've done it before. Yeah. And I know they would have liked it, but it's the screaming and yelling from the other people on the ride that freaked them out. Grand Rapid Falls, what a mistake. Yeah. That's something you do like midday peak heat where you have time to dry off. There's a reason why it was wide open at 5 o'clock because people know better. No, and the worst part is when we were heading over there, my wife said, we shouldn't do this. Let's not do this. And you had to do it. Yep. And when we got off, you know what she said? Told you so. I told you so. Well, it only cost you 210 bucks. So. <laughs> <laughs> can't take it with you. No, you can't. But you sure can get billed for it every month oh, with interest yeah. from the oh, credit card yeah. company. Oh, yeah. You guys are going to be paying for that trip for a while in more ways than one. I can't stop thinking about how bad I just want to go back and get the stuff done that we didn't do. I have OCD like that. I just want to go and get those rides done that we left on the table. We left a lot on the table. For as much as we did, we left a lot you on the table. You can't do Disneyland in one day. No, you cannot. You cannot do it. You cannot. You know what I heard? I don't know if this is a this is a real rumor or not, that Disneyland doesn't have a permit for the fireworks, and they pay the fine on it every night, and it's pretty substantial. It's been going on for so long that it's just like, it's almost laughable because they send this bill every morning for doing the fireworks at night, and they pay it wholeheartedly. Not only is that crazy, but I heard that just the popcorn sales alone every day at Disneyland pays for the fireworks something to think about in the grand scheme of things yeah pretty nuts i also heard that they have hundreds and hundreds of cats yeah that eat mice at night yeah yeah which was pointed out by a celebrity who mentioned it on a talk show that isn't it ironic that they have cats eating mice every night when the entire empire was built on a mouse (laughs) what are you gonna do We're going to sign off. Yep. Thank you so much for listening to The Fellowship. We will catch you next Monday. See you next week.